These men and women are doing important jobs for us. They work for the United States government as map makers, helping to make very detailed, accurate maps of the very land you live on. Whether it's planning, photographing, measuring, compiling, scribing, each job has its place in the complicated process of representing accurately part of a round earth on a flat piece of paper. Most of the map makers work in this building, part of the United States Geological Survey. One of the important jobs of the Geological Survey is to map accurately every square mile in our country. It's a never-ending job because man keeps changing the land he lives on. The U.S. Geological Survey makes many different maps of our country, but this perhaps is one of the most important because it shows us so much detail of our land surface. It's a topographical map showing us such things as the elevation of land by the use of contour lines, the drainage pattern of the streams and rivers, and the location of woodlands or forests. The map also shows what man has built, what we call cultural features. The towns and cities, highways, fences, railroads, even radio and TV towers. This kind of government topographic map is often called a quadrangle map or simply a quad map. Notice that its shape is similar to that of a quadrangle or four-sided figure. In this case, formed by two meridians of longitude, seven and a half degrees apart, crossed at 90 degree angles by two parallels of latitude, also seven and a half degrees apart. Each quad map shows us about 50 to 70 square miles of land surface of our country. It takes over 35,000 of these large scale quad maps put together to show accurately what's on every square mile of land in the United States. It also takes over three years just to complete the many steps necessary to make one of these quad maps. Let's see if you and I can do it in just minutes to give you some idea of how maps are made. What's the first step? Well, simply to plan carefully the development of the new quad map. Highly trained engineers spend hours discussing what needs to be done, as well as in what order. Once they agree on such things as what should be included in the new map, how much it will cost, what people will do the many jobs. Then they are ready to begin carrying out the first step required in actually making the map, gathering the necessary information. We've said before that a map is similar to taking a picture of our Earth looking directly down on its surface. So one of our first jobs is aerial photography, taking aerial photographs of the quadrangle of our country that's to be mapped, photographing from the air the land surface below. It requires a very special camera that can be locked into position over a hole in the bottom of the airplane so that the camera is aimed straight down on the earth when flying. Requirements for filming are very strict. The day must be clear and sunny with no clouds to make shadows on the ground and little or no wind that might bump the plane off course, either up or down or sideways. Approaching the quadrangle, the pilot must fly the plane in a special pattern over the land to make sure that each still picture taken overlaps part of the last picture taken. This is what the camera sees flying at the required altitude over the land below. Every so many seconds, the cameraman, looking through a viewfinder, presses a button, taking yet another still picture of the land below. It's not long before the filming is done and it's back to the airport to unload and process the film. Here is what the airplane saw as it flew high above the land. Notice the river in this part of the photograph. Can you find a highway? Here it is, running in this direction. The photographs make everything look pretty flat, don't they? How can we determine the elevation of land in these photographs? or even the latitude and longitude of certain points in each picture. Such photographs have little value until we can fit them into the known or established network of reference points here on Earth. Known points of latitude and longitude and elevation. This requires another important step in map making, 
a step called analytical aerotriangulation, which are two pretty big words that need some illustration. For example, suppose points A, B, and C are easily identifiable landmarks in one of our aerial photographs. Let's say A represents a large tree, B a corner fence post, and C a small building. Through a system of mathematics, using what is called triangulation, we can find the exact position of A, B, and C by measuring angles and distances to known points of latitude and longitude close by. We will then know the exact ground position of each photograph helping to make the new map. We can even determine through triangulation the elevation of the tops of mountains, markers on hills, any landmark available in the photograph. It's all part of the work done by field survey teams, engineers who actually go out into the field to the area that was photographed. Here they find the landmarks circled in the photos, set up their scientific measuring equipment, and begin checking out the aerial pictures for exact position of landmarks. They determine angles, measure distances, and record details on the ground not seen by the camera in the airplane. This piece of equipment is called a theodolite. One member of the team sights through this telescope-like instrument from the landmark found to a known marker positioned by another team member. By sighting different points, precise angles can be determined to help in the triangulation process. But what about distance? This instrument was designed just for that. It's called an electronic distance measuring device. By bouncing an electronic signal off the marker and back to the receiver, the instrument records quickly the exact distance to the marker within a hundredth of an inch. Several weeks of hard work are spent checking, measuring, recording carefully all information, making sure that what was photographed from the air can be located precisely here on the ground. When the field survey teams have completed their work, a number of steps begin to actually compile the new map. Compile means to collect or bring together on a special machine like this all of the information from the aerial photographs and from the work done by the field survey team. One of the first jobs is to make from the aerial photographs a diapositive. Notice how it looks something like a large photographic slide. Holes are drilled into the diapositives locating each landmark checked by field survey. The position of each landmark is even fed to a computer, where from the stored information on this tape, a very complicated machine called a photo plotter automatically will begin to trace out on special plastic material all control points for the beginning features of the new quad map. It's really preparation for this machine, called a stereo plotter. Here the map compiler sees through two eyepieces what is on two projected diapositive slides placed at the top of the machine. The projected slides give a stereo image of what the camera saw from the airplane at two different positions. It's a kind of three-dimensional effect from the overlapping photographs. In other words, the machine recreates landform in three dimensions, allowing the map compiler to trace what he sees onto a flat mapping surface. After adjusting the plotter to the known landmarks, the compiler can begin to trace, or what we call scribe, all the lines necessary to show every feature needed for our new quad map. Even the contours of mountains are traced at intervals of 10 feet. When the compiler is finished, there will be not one but three plastic sheets or plates containing all the information needed. The plates are checked and rechecked by staff engineers to make sure there are no mistakes. Even field checking is important when construction on new buildings or highways began after the map was started. When the planning engineers are satisfied that what has been compiled and checked meets all the necessary requirements, then it's time to begin drawing the final map. It's a step that also has a very long name to it. It's called cartography. Actually, the men and women who work here as cartographers do not draw the final map in that sense of the word. 
Instead, they scribe the plate in much the same way that the map compiler did. However, the instruments used are quite different. For example, this young lady is using what is called a fine point needle scriber. Her job is to scribe or cut into the mylar plate all the drainage patterns traced by the stereo plotter. In other words, she's drawing the final plate that will show all the streams and rivers on the new map. All the lines you see scribed will show as blue lines on the final map. In fact, each color on the finished map must have a separate plate for the purpose of printing. When the scribing is complete, it's time to add the lettering to make sure that every feature is identified correctly. Finally, staff editors make one last careful check and then okay the map for printing. Printing or reproducing the final map is done on special printing presses back at Reston, Virginia. Each color added one at a time to form the final map. Basic reference lines, rivers, man-made features, trees and woodland, contours, all combining to form a new quad map. It's taken thousands of hours of careful planning and engineering on the part of hundreds of highly trained people in order to have this new topographic quad map, but it's well worth it because such maps are used by agencies and private companies everywhere for the information contained on them, or as a basis for making their own maps like the ones you find in your textbook. Even three-dimensional maps like this one showing the state of Utah have their beginning from basic quad maps and then are changed through a special process to hold their shape in three dimensions. For example, this gentleman's job is to design and carve out the land surface of Utah on this special plastic material. When he has checked carefully every detail, the mold is then locked securely inside this huge machine. From the pile of flat printed maps of Utah, the operator inserts one of them into the machine and pushes the start button. Automatically, the machine goes to work to form the map. Gee, it's almost too quick, isn't it? Let's see the process once more, but this time in slow motion. There, under great pressure and heat, the map is actually sucked down onto the mold and pressed hard to form the exact shape of the elevated surfaces. After cooling, the map is removed and will retain its shape forever. Map making is a complicated process and you've seen only a small part of it. There are many thousands of different maps made by the United States government and many more thousands by private companies each with a different purpose in mind, but all with the same objective, to help you and me find our way.